Okay. All right, thank you for the introduction. Um, so my name is Michael. Um, I'm a local, grew up in Boulder. Um, went to El Dorado K-8 for my elementary school and middle school, and then went to Fairview High School, where I did the IB program um, for four years. And then after that, I went to Stanford, um, where I just graduated from in June with a degree in chemistry. So uh, the next step for me, um, I was selected as a Rhodes Scholar last year, which means that they cover one to three years of school in England um, at Oxford University. So I'll be going there for one to two years to study global health and computer science. So, yeah, I guess I'll just start off um, with some general comments. Since we have a whole range of ages here, from you know parents to little kids in the back. Um, one of the most important things, I think, at any age, whether you're in elementary school, whether you're in high school, or even through college or adult life, is to always stay curious. Um, one thing that I think has helped me a lot is just always being open to new ideas and talking to people from the whole spectrum of ages, right? I think we have a tendency to focus on talking to people our same age, you know? We like to hang out with our friends and chat with them about what's going on in, in your life, but you can learn a lot from talking to different sections of people, right? You can learn a lot from talking to your grandparents, to older people, to get that perspective, and then you can also learn a lot by talking to people who are younger than you, and you know, doing public service and tutoring, things like that. Um, so like one instance in which this has really played a big role for me is um, in high school, I did some research. Um, I worked at a laboratory at the University of Colorado at Boulder, um, doing some chemical engineering research that ended up becoming a science fair project. And then at science fair, um, there happened to be a professor there who was lecturing about uh, neuroscience. He's a neuroscientist from the University of Wyoming, and he showed this video of this cool new technology that was recently developed. Um, the technology is called optogenetics, and it's basically a way to control the brain with the light. So he showed this video, I remember it very clearly, of this mouse running in a circle, and the light was shining on its brain that was causing its motor cortex to activate and then like run in a circle like this, like over and over again. Like it was like mind control. So I was kind of naive, but I thought that was pretty cool. So I decided, okay, I'm gonna go work with this guy. So he's at Stanford University, so when I got to Stanford, I decided to work with him, and um, you know I joined his lab freshman year, and that kind of open-mindedness and the curiosity kind of led me to that opportunity, which has then kind of solidified my interest in neuroscience and has made me want to go into medicine. So I think that you can learn a lot just by being open and being being um, being open to chance encounters. You know, sometimes things like this will happen without any sort of planning or goal-directed behavior, right? We all have a tendency to think, oh, you know, college is the next thing, right? If you're a high schooler, I need to get into a good college, and that's my future, right? Once I get into college, everything will be good. It's, life doesn't work that way, though, right? College is just one step um, on, on, a, on many steps in, in life's ladder, right? So by being open-minded, you kind of, I think you develop a healthier approach, a healthier outlook to life that will serve you well in your adult life, too. Right? Life goes on. You're only going to spend four years in college. Where you go to college doesn't really matter. It's what you do in college that counts. So that's just a, a bit of a life lesson, I guess, that I've learned. And I think it's, uh, it's, it's a helpful one to keep in mind. Yeah. I mean, that's, I don't want to like extend the introduction too long. So if anybody has questions, just feel free to ask. I'd be happy to answer. Yeah, go ahead. What's I do? Oh, what's IB? Oh, okay, that's a great question. Sorry, I skipped over that. Uh, the high scores probably know very well what IB is. IB is, it stands for International Baccalaureate. And it's this international program based in the UK, but basically it's a high school program that is in the last two years of high school. And when you sign up for IB, it's similar to AP in that you take advanced courses. But IB is internationally recognized, and it, you take a lot of advanced classes that are technically college level, so you can get a lot of college credit for doing that. And you know, not only is it a challenge and really good if you're looking for you know, more difficult coursework and to learn more in class, it's also really great to develop kind of your reading and writing abilities. Um, that's something that people kind of overlook. They say, oh, why do IB when there's a bunch of AP classes I can just take? But IB includes more than just classes. It's also an extended essay, which you write about some research project that you do. And it's also community service based. So there's this thing called CAS hours, which stands for 
Creativity, action, and service, I think. I don't know. You guys can check. Is that right? Okay, cool. It's been a, a few years. Um, but basically, they encourage you to be a well-rounded person, and I think that's very important. So, I recommend doing IB, um, no matter, no matter you know, where you are. If you have the opportunity, you should try to do it. Any other questions? Yeah, so you from your elementary school is at Dorado, right? Yeah. And you went to Southern Hill? Uh, I went to El Dorado for middle school as well. For middle school, yeah. for middle school as well, yes. So, so um, you're getting the summit. Yeah. <laughs> so you don't have to go to summit. <laughs> yeah, so, so this one I'm asking, you know, uh, compared to the classroom kind of, most people know, most parents want to know, send their kids to, to summit. And you are not from summit and then compared to classrooms, you know, out, out of classroom, you know, whether your parents, how much your parents help you or how much you study yourself, you know, can you give us some kind of over, kind of overview of you know, how much contributed to your, you know, to your success? Or how um, yeah, so the question is how much like, the out of school things have contributed? Or whether classroom, you know, how, how much, uh, how important the in-class educational you know, Versus out of class. Yeah, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. That's a good question. I think that, let's see, yeah, so, you know, people think of, of school as, you know, you go to a great school and you learn a lot in class and that'll get you into other great schools, college, and then things will all be good, right? But I think that's the wrong way to look at it. I think a lot of learning happens outside of class, actually, as a lot of you probably know. Um, you know, in class you talk about basic things like English, math, those give you the basic tools to go do things with, right? So for me, the thing I did out of class, in high school especially, was research. So um, I kind of just cold emailed some labs at CU and asked them, are you willing to take on a high school who knows nothing about what you're doing research on? You know, they tend to do things that are very advanced. But you know, with that basic toolkit you get in class, you, know, you take some chemistry, you take some biology, you can put those things together and <coughs> really go deep into an area that you care about outside of class. And that's where it's really valuable, right? Because you know, it's great, it's great to be involved in a lot of different activities, but only when you go deep into something do you really know if it's right for me, right? If you're just trying something for a few hours a week, you can get some sort of idea, but it's hard to know whether you could see yourself, for instance, in a career in research or in tutoring or in education, right? Depending on what you spend your time outside of class doing. So I think outside of class time is very important for your not only academic growth, but also personal growth and figuring out Okay, when I go to college, what do I want to study, right? So that way you don't just become lost in college. And, you know, you can apply this to after college, too. What career do you want to go into after college? That's something that you probably will learn, not from your classes, but from the other things you do outside of class. Yeah? How about things like history day, uh, sports, everything? Yeah. Yeah, those are also very important. <laughs> <laughs> Just do everything. <laughs> do everything. Okay. Um, but do explore. Do explore a lot and try a lot of different things. Because you know you, you can't you can't know whether you like something unless you try it, right? So high school is a great time for that. You know sometimes it's easy to get lost in the moment and think, oh man, I have a math test on Monday. I need to like study and hunker down for a sec. Can't be distracted by anything. But that, if you think like that all the time, then you kind of lose sight of the bigger picture, right? You have to remember sometimes, oh, high school, while it is higher stakes than middle school, it's, you know, it's still a time for you to explore with very little risk, right? When you start to have risk is when you turn into an adult, right? And you're like, okay, I have a family. The decision I make will probably impact my family. But in high school, it's just you, right? You're free to make your own decisions. And um, along with exploring, you know, it's great to do things extracurriculars like sports. Um, so, for instance, I was on the boys' swim team at Fairview. I also did some cross country. Um, and sports are really a great way to interact socially with people. I think um, while you know being focused on academics and career is important, you also need to think about personal growth. Um, that's something that people can forget about sometimes. And when you're on a, something like a swim team or some other sports team, you start to you know, build some friendships, right? And you, you talk to people in a non-academic setting. And that's really important because nowadays, whether you like it or not, it's not just about, you know, your skills in the workplace. It's about how you interact with people, who you know, things like that, right? In, in the majority of jobs that you, I can think of very few jobs where that is not the case. You know, maybe like a library or something. You don't have to have, you know, that kind of networking capability. 
but it can, be, it can really help you in your future career. So take time to build those relationships, learn how to interact with people in multiple different kinds of social contexts, whether it's in class, in, on a sports team, you know, what have you. Um, and yeah, his, Dad, you mentioned History Day, so that's something else that I, I did. Um, that's something that kind of comes through class, but it can turn into something much more if you decide to go deeper. Um, so I, I did History Day. Typically, I think it's something that sophomores do at Fairview High School as part of their AP US History class. And um, it's a, for those of you who have, aren't aware, um, it's a competition. It's a, it's a national competition called National History Day. And it basically starts at the local level. So you do a school competition, and you come up with some sort of project. Okay, So there's multiple categories that you can enter into. Um, and it starts off as a school project. You pick one of these categories. For me, that was a documentary. Um, there's other possibilities, too. I had some friends who did posters. You can do an individual performance, which it sounds pretty cool. If I were to do it again, I'd probably do a performance. Um, yeah, it's like an interpretive dance, kind of. It's really interesting. Um, and then you can also do like an essay, um, too. So there's multiple options. You choose a topic. I decided to write about the Apollo program and technological advances from that that kind of spun out of out of that initiative, and you tie it into this theme for the year. And then you know you do the school level. If you do well at school, then you go to the regional level. If you do well there, you go to the state, and then you go to nationals. Uh, so I was one of those people who was lucky enough to be able to make it to nationals. So they fly you out to DC. Um, you get to you know, check out DC, take some tours, and then also show off your work there. And there's, there's a competition at the national level, too, which is much more competitive. I didn't do so well there, but I got to ride on the Turns out there's a little train going from the U.S. Capitol building to the Senate offices. It's like a little mine cart, and you can ride down there. And got to see some famous people. All that stuff now, so that was fun. Um, yeah, but you know, just it's good to to diversify. I think your interests as a young person, and don't just focus on things like math or science, um, which I think people in the Asian community tend to emphasize more. I think it's also important to be able to read and write, right? In any profession you do, even if you're a scientist, you're gonna to have to know how to write, right? And that's gonna serve you very well. Um, and reading, being able to read is also obviously very important. Yeah, go ahead. Um, how did you find out that your passion was chemistry? How did I find out? That's <laughs> <laughs> um, impressive. Uh, great question. My passion. You know, passions are a funny thing. I think passions, at least for me, passions tend to be, it's kind of a fusion of not only what you think you're interested in, but also how good you are at something. So, for me, the chemistry was something that I kind of, it kind of just naturally clicked for me. You know, every, everyone has things that are naturally kind of inclined to. And for me, chemistry was one of those things. So I took some chemistry classes at Fairview, and I was like, oh, this is, this is really interesting. You know, I like learning about the building blocks about how our world works, right? Chemistry is kind of fundamental in that way. And I like chemistry because it's just one step below in terms of complexity from biology. And I care about biology because you know it's about how humans work. Um, medicine is based in biology. And kind of being one level below that gives you the tools to understand a lot of what happens in the biological world. So I figured, OK, chemistry is pretty interesting. And I'm not that bad at chemistry, it turns out, um, based on the classes. You know, Some, Sometimes I would help other kids and help, help the teacher kind of tutor in class, um, even though I was a student in the class. And I ended up you know, buying my own chemistry textbook sometimes. And in my free time, I would just read them sometimes. And then I found out about this thing called the US National Chemistry Olympiad, uh, which is kind of like, have you guys heard of USAMO or things like that? The USA Math Olympiad? It's, it's kind of like that, but for chemistry. So I signed up for that, um, did it the first year. It didn't do so well, and then tried again the next year. And I made it into like the top 50 or something in the country. And so that was, that was pretty fun, and I, I learned a lot along the way. And you know, that led into college, right? In college, I was like, okay, chemistry. It's, it's something that really fits in with my interests and what I want to do. You know, I want to be a physician and a scientist someday. So chemistry really aligned well in terms of the requirements to apply to med school. And you know, I figured I like it. And there's good people. Also, people are important, right? There's good people who are in this profession, and I want to connect with them. So. That kind of turned into a passion, I guess. That initial, some initial interest combined with some, I guess, some natural talent um, makes for a powerful combination. Yeah. Yes, go ahead. You have talked about your life in high school. Uh, can you also share some of the experience for 
early education for younger kids, like my child are still in kid, uh, daycares. So, <laughs> early, early, uh, age, how to prepare. Uh, another question is, uh, we all know that education never to be very stressful, and I think most of you heard some tragedy uh, stories about people, especially Asian students, that are depressed. How do you or some of your friends balance their life um, and maintain their mental health mission? Yes. Um, I, I like both of those questions. I'll start with the first one. Um, first of all, treat nap time like nap time in daycare. Don't read textbooks during nap time. <laughs> don't prepare for the chemistry lab yet. I don't recommend that. <laughs> um, but, uh, I mean, honestly, I think yeah, I, I think it's not healthy at a young age to be very goal-directed. Um, there are times for that, right? There are times when you have a goal, like I want to, for instance, I want to do well in National History Day. I, I'm going to focus on this for the next month and do really well. But in elementary school and before that in daycare, what's important is that, you know, first of all, your kid is happy, right? You don't want to force them into activities that would make them unhappy. But then again, there is a bit of a balance there, right? So, for instance, when I was in elementary school, throughout elementary school and even through middle school, I played the violin. And it was something that I just really, really did not enjoy that much, as my parents could attest to. <laughs> and I don't know how they did it, but somehow, even when my violin playing sounded like butchering chickens, they still put up with it. And, you know, paid for my lessons and made me do it. And I'm deep, that's something I'm deeply grateful for now, looking back, because now I can just pick up my violin and play, play a song that I hear on the radio, and it's really fun, and I really enjoy it. But it's one of those things that's, it's called, what I, I like to call it type two fun. Okay, so there's multiple kinds of fun. One kind of fun is fun that's just really enjoyable in the moment, right? Like, things like, oh, like playing basketball, or swimming, or you know, going for a hike. It's just really pleasurable in the moment. And then there are those things that are type two fun, which is stuff that you really, really don't like to do in the moment, but then you look back and you're like, oh, that was great, I'm really glad I did that thing, right? So that's an example of type two fun. And it's just a constant, um, I think as a, as a kid, it's a constant balance between those two kinds of fun, right? As a parent, you want to not just have your kid you know, play video games all day and have type one fun, you want to also put in some type two fun. And how you find that balance is, it's hard to generalize, um, but I think, you know, as a parent, you have a pretty good idea of your kid, and maybe you have some idea of their natural tendencies and interests, things that they might be good at, and you should try to foster those things. But don't, don't just choose one thing and narrow it down. Right? Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Spread them out across the multiple, and encourage kind of a broad, well-rounded exploration. I think that's helpful. Um, to answer the second part of your question, sorry, Kevin, um, about, about mental health. Um, I think mental health is really, it's a really difficult topic, um, and it's something at Stanford, we have something at Stanford, we call it the Stanford Duck Syndrome, um, and I don't know if you guys have seen ducks swimming underwater, but, you know, on the surface of the water, they look pretty calm, they're like, quack, 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 and then down there, they're like, furiously kicking, you know, and that's, that's the Stanford Duck Syndrome. So you go to Stanford, I don't know if any of you have been there, but, you know, it's really sunny, there's palm trees, campus is really beautiful, but, you know, there, you see these ducks, these students, biking around, and they all look really happy. But under the surface, there is more stuff going on than you might realize. And that's something I've seen. Um, I've, I've seen friends affected by um, you know, things like depression and other mental health issues. Because college can be a very stressful place, right? Um, for one, you know, coursework takes a step up, for sure. You have more work. Even though you have more free time, you know, there are a lot of commitments that people have, right? People start their own student groups, people participate in music groups, acapella, sports teams. There's a lot competing for your time, just like in high school. And not only that, but you don't really have the support network that you necessarily would have at home, right? Your parents aren't around, it's just you. So people can feel isolated at times. And one way to prevent, you know, kind of avoid that is by making friends early on. I think that initial like month or two at college is really important for making close friendships. Um, because people are open to, to that, right? You know, if, if you see someone sitting in the dining hall your first week and you go introduce yourself, they'll probably be pretty receptive to that. But, you know, if you go as a senior and you're like, oh, hey, um, who are you? They'll be like, who's this creep? Like, what does he want from me? <laughs> I'm gonna go eat my fries outside. Yeah, so you want you to be mindful of, like, those initial few months. They're, they're very important in terms of getting your feet settled. 
Um, something else that I think is important is taking time to settle in and adjust to the new environment before you start doing all these different clubs and activities. Um, I think people, people come into college with the same high school mentality of, oh, I need to do well in college, do all this, these things, so that way I can get a good job after I get out of college. And that's just kind of short-sighted, right? You're looking at the next rung on the ladder, and then being goal-directed, how do I get there, right? But you don't see the whole ladder itself and where it's going. Maybe your ladder is going off a cliff, but you only see the next rung, so you don't realize that, right? So what's important is that you take time to slow down, don't jump into a lot of things right away, and make sure that you can handle things you have to do, like the classes, and make sure you, quote unquote, waste time just hanging out with people and making friends. That's time that's not wasted at all. I think it's very valuable. Yeah. So. Uh, let's go to Kobe. Waiting so long. Sorry. So um, you, you mentioned that you did scientific research. Do you take uh, SRS to like kind of allocate some time to the scientific research? You know, I never did that actually. Were you um, able to like actually put in time for, like? For the research during the school year? Yeah, yeah, I was. Um, and I, yeah, it's, it's tough though, right? It's tough. Um, I think during the summer, you know, during summers is a great time to do research because you can go in pretty much every day and do it full time. But during the year, it's hard to keep it going. Uh, what's important, I find, is that just consistency is very important, right? So if you can find a day, for instance, I think in my, maybe my junior year, I had seventh period off. So on block days, you know, I would get out of class at 1.30. And I would just go into the lab and work from 1.30 till 6 or something. And have a chunk of, like a large chunk of time to spend in the lab um, every week. And that kind of consistency is helpful because your supervisor can build up more trust with you, first of all, and assign you more responsibilities because they know you're going to show up at that time. And then second of all, I think it's, um, it's important for your own scheduling too so that you're not like, oh, it's Wednesday, you know, I'm kind of tired, I'm just going to go home and take a nap instead of going in. You kind of keep yourself accountable and force yourself into it. SRS, I you know, I had some friends who did it and they had a good experience. But what you learn is that a lot of these things you can kind of learn on your own. And you don't necessarily have to follow the, the beaten path, per se, to, to get where you want. Um, and Science Row is one of those things for me. I never took the class, but I ended up doing OK. Um, I went to the Intel International Science Fair um, in Phoenix that year. And then you know, got, got a first place award in, in my category. And it didn't require any of this SRS, any of this stuff. Um, it was just kind of figuring out things for yourself. Um, that's where a lot of the learning came from. Um, uh, so uh, Lynn and Nicole, did you decide to go to Stanford? I believe you get many offers, right? So I got a couple. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is that um, early or just the final, you do some preparation and make the final decision? Oh, did I apply early? Yeah. Yeah. So I so what I did was I applied early to Harvard, uh, was deferred from Harvard. So that was kind of a I was like I was kind of disappointed at that point. Um, wasn't great, but you know then I was like okay I'll just apply to all these other schools. So I applied to um, you know Stanford, um, Yale, MIT, you know CU, kind of the typical schools trying to go for a balance. Um, I ended up getting into um, Stanf Stanford, MIT, Yale. Um, those were kind of the top three that I was kind of bouncing around. And what I ended up realizing was, so I visited Yale in February, actually. Um, they had this special program for kids who are doing more science-related research, um, who are interested in STEM. They're kind of trying to foster that at the school. So they, they actually let me know that I got in in February. It's, it's called a likely letter. So they send it out early before admissions decisions come out in, in March, end of March. Um, so we got, they flew us out there. And I just remember hating the weather. It was absolutely terrible. I landed in, let's see, I landed in JFK, and then I was supposed to transfer to a flight to, to, the, um, to like the Connecticut New Haven Airport. And I just remember they, it was during the polar vortex that year, so my flight got canceled like five times, and then I ended up having to take the train into New Haven. So I take the train for like two hours into New Haven. I get there, and then it's like midnight. It's sketchy, because New Haven's not the safest city, uh, so I'm, and all the taxis are, there's no taxis on the road, nobody's on the road. So I ended up like walking from the train station all the way to campus in the dark with my baggage, and I'm just like cold and disappointed, so I ended up not going to Yale, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so, so I ended up not going there, and then MIT, I think MIT is a great school, um, I could definitely see myself going there, but 
I remember just visiting Stanford and then seeing the you know the big trees and the nice weather and seeing all the happy ducks going around. I was like, I'm gonna go to Stanford. Yeah. So yeah. Did you play video games? <laughs> Um, yes, I definitely do. Um, video games, yeah, like I said earlier, they're type one fun. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with enjoying yourself and playing video games. The danger about video games is that, first of all, they're addictive, right? You get that dopamine rush, and then you're like, oh, this is great. I'm just going to play video games and not talk to anybody. But the thing that video games, you miss out on with video games is social interaction. Um, and that's something I realized, it took me until high school to realize that. I liked video games a lot in middle school played a fair bit too during that time, but it was in high school when I realized, oh, like I'm missing out on a lot of stuff. And I think for a lot of kids there's a natural kind of shift in high school where you realize, oh, I want to hang out more with my peers rather than playing video games. So, so I kind of felt that. So I, I t turned down my video game playing, except you know with friends sometimes, and I focus more on other things. So, yes? How much do you think your parents contributed to like you going to uh, major in oh, I think a huge amount. Yeah, I mean, first of all, like biologically, right? Like, you know, <laughs> sperm eats the egg and then it's fertilized and come out with a baby, right? So that's important. Um, but I mean, more more seriously though, um, yeah, I think I think it played a, a fairly large role. Are, are you talking about the decision to go to Stanford or just kind of just like, going to college in general? I think just like through like high school, like pushing you to like do math. Or, like, <laughs> Well, there was, I'll be honest, there wasn't really much of a push. Like, oh, for instance, the science fair thing, right? How did I start, how did I get interested in science fair? Um, well, the reason I started doing research was because I heard that one of my friends was doing research, and he was having a great time in this um, RNA lab at CU and doing some great research, and he did science fair and did, did well. I was like, oh, I want to do that too. So then, you know, it's sophomore summer, summer after sophomore year, and I decided, okay, I'm just going to email some professors and try to get into a lab. And that, you know, that was kind of my own initiative, not really my parents. I mean, they, they supported me, right? They helped me. They helped look over those email drafts, give me comments on ways to improve, and then kind of, you know, they're both scientists previously, so they had some experience to, to tell me. But in terms of the, that initiative, that, I think, was largely independent. And not just in science fair, but in a lot of other things. Um, I, will, I will say, though, there are areas where my parents kind of push me, for instance, I think in sports is one area where they really they really emphasize like kind of physical health, and that's one area that they were not willing to really compromise on. So I would, you know, I they would kind of force me to continue um, swimming and you know encourage me to do like cross country things like that. And I think that was really good in retrospect, uh, because you know in high school there's a lot of things competing for your time. Maybe you know you want to do debate club and that interferes with swimming or whatever sport you like to do. You know, they kind of gently encouraged me to do more sports and keep those sports rather than just tossing them out and focusing on purely academic things. Yeah. Um, how do you think your friends played a role in who you eventually came to be and like where you ended up? Like, were they also as academically inclined? Yeah. I would, I would say they, yeah, that's a good question. I would say they were. They were quite academically inclined. Um, I don't know if you've heard the saying before of, you tend to be like the average of your five closest friends, <coughs> the five people you spend the most time with. So you know, if you're married, you're, you'll, your spouse is hopefully one of the top five people you spend time with. Um, <laughs> if you're a kid, it's like the five people, well, your parents, your, maybe your siblings, and then your close friends, right? So try to, try to be friends with people who kind of share common values and interests because you can synergize off of each other and learn a lot from them, right? So like the case where, I mean, I just said this, but why did I choose to do research in the first place? It was because one of my friends was doing it. So I, I thought, okay, this is something I want to do. I wouldn't have known about it otherwise. Um, why, yeah, why did I end up you know, pursuing science in college? Part of that was because I found a great group of friends who were also interested in that at Fairview. Um, so at Fairview, I had some close friends and we would be involved in a lot of the same activities. For instance, speech and debate, um, science bowl, um, web team, things like that. And what would happen was, we would end up kind of, quote unquote, wasting time, but not really. We would just hang out in the parking lot after 
like on a Friday night after Science Bowl, we'd get out of Science Bowl at five and then just hang out in the parking lot and like sit. We'd have a little tailgate party and just you know sit in a trunk and chat for for an hour or two about wh whatever you know. And those bonds, I mean, those, yeah. Personally, like you get a lot out of those, right? Like life, a lot of life is about relationships, and those are really important. And you know, I still keep in touch with these friends. But also, it's it's some form of like peer support and encouragement that you get out of that, where you see other people doing the same thing you are, and it makes you kind of, in some ways, not care so much about what other people think about you, um, because in for me, for me at least, I've, I've seen this a lot in high school. In high school, people care a lot about what others think about them, and that can dictate a lot about their actions, right? If they see someone like, you know, messing around and just hanging out after school, and not doing their homework, they'll be like, "Oh man, like that's what the cool kids do. I want to do that too." But if you surround yourself with people who are like you, people who care about things you care about, then you don't feel that as much. You feel normal, right? Because you are like them, and they are like you. Did I answer your, sorry, you had another part to your question. Um, no, that was good. Okay, that's it. Cool. Yes, go ahead. What's your idea on um, Chinese school study? Okay. Chinese school? Yeah. Like that's this? That, that's it. Uh, did they have it before? For yeah. Oh, up? that's that's definitely type two fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Chinese school, it's one of those things, yeah, it is exactly one of those things that was extremely painful in the moment. <laughs> I remember sitting in class often and like looking at my watch, like, oh, man, two hours, two hours can be so long, <laughs> unless you're playing video games. Um, yeah, um, but it's Chinese school. I think it's you know one thing I've noticed, and you know this might be like scratching your own backs, but kids who tend to do Chinese school tend to be the ones who do better later on. Like whether it's well, however you me measure, right? Whether it's like how they do in high school, how they do in college, whatever. Um, that's just my own personal observation. And I think Chinese school encourages some, some form of discipline, in addition to the, obviously, about the Chinese culture and the knowledge that you gain, which is also very important. I think a lot of people who don't do Chinese school, they miss out on all of that, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you, you ask them about, like, Sun Wukong, and they're like, is that the, the monkey in the zoo or something? <laughs> <laughs> they have no idea. So, and that, that's important, because I think as Chinese people, it's, it's easy, in the US, it's easy to lose touch of who you are. And, no matter how American you try to be, people look at you and they still see that you're a Chinese person. So I think it's important to know a bit about the heritage. I mean, I don't know a lot, but you do know more than you would if you didn't do Chinese school. Um, and it's also great because it lets you connect with relatives. I think that's a big bonus um, for Chinese school. So you do think it's harmful? Yeah. yeah, of course, yeah. And I'm not just saying that because everyone will like, mob me if I. <laughs> no, it really is a good thing. I believe. Yes. Sorry, kids. I know you don't want to. Be. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yes. Uh, so, uh, as a parent, I have a very interesting, um, really disturbing observation. Uh, so, Asian students tend to hang out with the other Asian students. Um, so, do you feel you have more diverse, close friends, or they are very isolated, Asian, small friends group? And the other part of this is, at the same time, even at a Chinese school, I see most of the Asian kids are speaking English to their friends, not in Chinese. Uh, so, like, can you make this presentation in Chinese? <laughs> um, okay, so to answer the first part of your question, um, how many of my friends are Asian? And what do I think about the clickiness? Um, well, we were talking about friends friend groups before, and I think it's, it's totally natural to want to associate with people who look like you, who share the same family values as you, and your parents probably know each other, I think that's that's fine. And you should embrace those friendships. But on the other hand, you know, it's it is good to form a diverse group of friends. And how do you do that, right? How do you do that? If you're doing things like science bowl, science fair, chances are the people you interact with in those contexts will be people who are like you, like typically Asian kids, right? I mean, I don't know, is Kevin Young here? Oh, he's teaching he's, his class. He's teaching. Okay. <laughs> Anyways, I think you could say that in Fairview Science Bowl, like most of the kids are Asian. And nothing wrong with that. I think you can form great Asian friends, and I think you should. But, you know, it's through things like, like swimming, 
um, other sports, um, classes, where you make friends with people who are different from you. And that's very important. I think that's one of the most important parts of friendship, right? Is meeting people who are different to kind of broaden your worldview, um, learn how to interact with different kinds of people, and grow personally and even professionally, right? Because these friends might end up becoming your business partners or something in the future. And um, at least in college, that's that's one of the best parts about going to college, I think, is just the fact that you're exposed to people of your same age who are interested in all sorts of different things, right? And the fact that you're forced to, to share a room with someone freshman year is, is something that's, that's really great, I think. And oftentimes, they pair you with someone who you have no idea. You, you're like, how am I at all related to this person, except that we share the same gender, you know? Like, sometimes that happens. But you learn a lot from talking with people of different backgrounds. So I encourage people, you know, make Asian friends, but also make non-Asian friends, and do things that will allow you to be exposed to other kinds of people. And the second, sorry, can you repeat the second part of the question? It's really not a question, it's more like an observation. Okay. Because uh, even in the Chinese school, I see kids are talking in English to each other and to their parents. It makes me feel nervous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for example, my kids, uh, my daughter is, uh, four years old, yeah. uh, in daycare, she's hanging around with the other Asian girl in her class, and the other Asian girl is not speaking Chinese at all. Yes. Um, so that makes me feel nervous, <laughs> as a parent, because my English is not that good when she growing up and only speak English to me. Right, right. Um, yeah, that's something that, so there's been phases in my life where I've tried to speak to my parents only in Chinese. But then I find that they either don't understand me, or usually it's I don't understand them. <laughs> so whenever I notice whenever we talk about something serious, my parents will switch to English because they know I'll understand them, and we can have a clear communication. Um, I think that one thing is like try to interact with relatives a lot in Chinese. That's one of the ways in which my Chinese improved a lot. Is when my grandparents came over, or when I went back to China. When, when either of those two things happened, my Chinese level would go up a lot. And I, I would find myself speaking more in Chinese and thinking more in Chinese, too, than I did before. Um, but I think that it's natural. I mean, we are in the United States. It's natural for people to speak English um, in order to fit in, right? I mean, you were asking about um, how, kind of, how people tend to form friendships with people of the same race. And if you speak Chinese in your friend group, then that is just going to build like an iron wall around yourself in terms of your social environment in your high school or what have you. Right? So I see pros and cons, but coming to Chinese school is a way to keep the Chinese part alive while also living in this country. Yeah. Yes? Um, how did you overcome your challenges? <laughs> wow. Deep, deep questions. First, you asked me about my passions. Now, it's about my challenges. Um, yeah, how did I overcome my challenges? Let's see. What are some of the challenges I've had? Um, I'll say there have been times. Yeah, okay. One of the challenges I had was when I, when I first started high school. You know how I said about, oh, in the first month, you have to make a lot of, try to make a lot of friends because people are more open? Um, that, was, that was challenging um, because I, I came from a school, I came from El Dorado, and not many kids from El Dorado go to Fairview. Um, whereas, you know, if you go to Summit or Southern Hills, you'll know a lot of people already going there. So that was kind of a challenge for me, um, socially. So I had to kind of, I had a few friends going with me, which I was very fortunate to have, but I, had, I really had to branch out and make new friends. And it's, it's tougher than you might think to do that when people have already formed these cliques that they know. But I kind of made an, uh, an active effort to you know, open up and hang out with, with people and make, make friendships. But it was challenging because it, some, sometime in the middle of freshman year, I realized that you know, these, these people that I'm hanging out with, I'm actually not that closely aligned with them in terms of my values and who I want to be, right? Like I'm, I think one of them was like doing drugs. Like you know, they, they were not like they were not the kind of people that I wanted to be. So I realized this, and I thought, oh man, like I need to branch out again and find the people who I resonate with. And that's something that took you know maybe a year or so. But 
then that's when I found that group that we would have these you know, long parking lot conversations with and that kind of thing. Um, it, w it wasn't until then that I got that. So the social environment took some time for me in high school. That's one of my challenges that I had. Another was just the, the academic level. Um, I think coming from a school that was um, like El Dorado, I, I remember the first day in Spanish class, I, I was in Spanish three, which is pretty advanced for freshmen. It's supposed to be like for only kids from Summit, but somehow I got into that class. And I remember it was a struggle at first. I couldn't speak as well, I couldn't listen as well as a lot of the other kids. A lot of them were like sophomores or juniors. So that was a bit of a, a challenge, but I think it was, it was overall a good thing for me because I was, I was kind of an underdog. And I think being an underdog is great because you have no expectations, right? Everyone's like, oh, you know, they're gonna lose, they're an underdog, who cares? And you, you can always see, see the person above you, right? And you're not the smartest person in the room. And you're able to see, okay, how can I be like that person? How can I learn from them? And become better at Spanish, or become better at swimming, what have you. So um, that's another thing, is try to surround yourself with people who are smarter than you. Oftentimes, those people are older than you, too. So don't be afraid to engage with people who are older than you. They can be very good mentors. Um, but how did I overcome the academic challenge? I think a lot of it just came down to, to time and you know, being efficient with my time in high school and you know, trying to learn the material as deeply as I could in a limited amount of time so that I could also have time to do other things outside of class. Yes? I have a question here. So this question might be the follow-up of the question of that. Yeah. So I have a, you know, you grew up here in America, right? Yes. So we, the parents, the, we grew up receiving education back in China. Right. So I'm wondering if there's any, the, any time I believe there is, that you feel there is a communication barrier between you and your parents, and how do you, how did you come, overcome those kind of barriers? Or is there any like way that you really appreciate how your parents talk to you and you can share with us? Yeah, definitely. Um, one of the, hopefully this is not too personal. <laughs> 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 uh, well, you know, like, like most Chinese parents, you probably say a lot of chung yi, right? <laughs> like these sayings. I have no idea what any of that stuff means. <laughs> they start saying this stuff like, like you know, like, su di wu yi in san or stuff like that. And I was like, I don't know what that means. <laughs> can you say that again so I can do my Google Translate? So that's, that's like a big communication barrier because I think you can communicate a lot with Cheng Yi, right? They're very apt descriptions of things that you sometimes can't really translate into English. So I'm fortunate that my parents have speak pretty good English, but sometimes it's tough to understand or express that kind of a meaning in English. And I mean, that's not a bad thing, it's just a fact. And something that Chinese school, I think another way in which it's very important is that you get some of that cultural background and some of the language capability that will allow you to understand these kinds of deeply rooted traditions and sayings that I think carry a lot of wisdom. Yeah. Hopefully that answers your question. So I, I want to go a little bit deep, a little bit more deep. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, is there a time that you really think your parents don't understand you, maybe because of the value you receive here, different from the values your parents receive back in China? Somehow those kind of different you know, understanding will like make it difficult for you to communicate with each other? Have you like encountered such kind of moments in your, in your life that you really need to struggle or push hard to overcome that? Um, yeah, for instance, mm -hmm. so one example that comes to mind is a very recent one. Mm -hmm. So somehow in the Chinese community, there is this sense that if you take a gap year, something is wrong with you, right? Mm -hmm. There's this idea of, oh, you know, we have this ladder of life, right? At the end is like becoming a doctor or a lawyer or something, right? And then each step is like, all right, how do we get to the next rung? How do we get to the next rung? And then eventually, hopefully, you'll end up at the top. And if not, then you're like a disappointment to the, all the families. <laughs> but I think all of that is just, you know, forget about that, right? Um, think about, think about like the amount that you'll learn in a gap year. So. What I'm doing now, I'm basically, so to tell you a little bit more about myself, um, so I'm going to study at Oxford for two years, and then I'm going to come back and do um, an MD-PhD. And, you know, that's a long training program, so 
one of the, the conflicts that I guess I had with my parents, especially my mom, was that you know, her impression was, oh, gap years are just a waste of time. You know, might as well get started on medical school. You know, that way you can start your career earlier and you won't be like 40 by the time you get out of school. But you know, I, I think that taking a gap year is actually a really important aspect of personal growth. Well, something I've noticed is that my high school friends who graduated the same year and people who took a gap year before college have done really well. Um, and they have some level of maturity and life experience that people like me didn't have in college. Right? They've been living by themselves for a year. Um, some, of, some of my friends like traveled to South America, did community service work, you know, worked real jobs in, in like emergency rooms in South America, spoke Spanish, and made their own living. And that is really good for personal growth. And it, it frames your future education in a way that you don't necessarily have the perspective to appreciate if you go straight through. So um, while, it is, while it can be kind of frustrating as a parent to think, oh, my kid is just delaying their education one more year. you know, Why waste this year? Like It means they did, failed and didn't get into college or something. No, that's not, not the case at all. Like One of my friends got into Princeton and then took a gap year before she went, right? This is the one who went to South America. And she's been great now. So I think that there are, there are times when this kind of traditional notion of step by step, OK, I need to get to the next thing. Don't, don't take any time between. Try to race to the finish. Graduate college in three years. No, nah, don't, like, don't, don't abide by that. I think that's unhealthy. Take your time. And in terms of conflict, back to, back to conflict with my parents, there was some resistance to doing that. And I eventually kind of, I guess I persuaded them. But you know, they 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 were hesitant at first, but it, it is really a great opportunity so that I'm hoping to take full advantage of. Yeah. Okay, last question. Yeah, well, yeah. Anybody? It will be your last question. Everyone's afraid. It better be a good question. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Is there anything you regret you didn't do? So for example, <laughs> anything I regret? Uh, you know, I think yeah, there are a lot of regrets. I mean, there are a lot of what ifs, which I think are a little bit different from regrets. Okay. Um, but you know, I, th I think about what if, for instance, in college, right? I spent, I spent a lot of time doing research in college. Like, I remember sophomore year, junior year, there was a point where I was spending about 20 to 30 hours a week in the lab, in addition to you know, coursework and homework and you know, dancing and swimming, all these other activities. And I don't know how I survived it, but I did. But you know, sometimes I look back and I wonder, you know, what if I had spent less time in the lab? What if I had spent more time, you know, doing this activity, like doing acapella or, you know, hanging out with friends, going to parties, right? There are these what if questions, and you know, life has choices, and you have to make choices. And when you when you think too much about that, you can kind of get in these mental loops of, oh, if I if only I hadn't done this, then I, I everything would have been good. But you know, you have to realize that you know that's past. And there, life is long. There are still many opportunities in the future to, you know, course correct and you know, emphasize more about social interaction or personal life. So I, one thing I, I regret, I guess, to summarize is I was very goal directed early on in college, and I still had this kind of high school mindset, which was unhealthy, um, of oh, okay, I'm going to get to the next thing. All right. So my first few years of college, I was very driven, and I was okay. I'm going to get into um, an MD PhD program for sure. That's what I want to do, and I think I missed out on some of the um, maybe the social aspect of college early on because of that. But senior year, I realized you know personal growth in college is very important, and I think I made up for some of that. Um, turned up a little bit. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. So we really appreciate you know, sharing your experience, and wish you the best for your future study and uh, and career. Thank you. Thanks, thanks for listening. Yeah.